Welcome to Real Vision of the Defiance Hebdomadal Hopscotch Through the Hip, the Happening of the Haphazard of Hard Cash Alternatives. Holding down her place for the second week in a row is Real Vision's Elaine Lee. And hanging out alongside her is the Defiance Hispanic hero, Camilla Russo. I'm, of course, hungry to hear what they have to hold forth about as we hobble horrifyingly to the conclusion of this half-baked introduction. Rushes in the news, NFTs refuse to go away, and a big mystery might finally have been solved. Elaine, I know you're chomping at the bit to tell us about stuff. What is on your radar this week? I love that bloody intro. That was fantastic, Robin. Okay, for me, oh man, Saturday evening was no joke for me. So I'm just chilling. You know, it's the weekend. I'm jamming, thinking about what steak to put on the grill. Next thing you know, notifications on Twitter. Boom, 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 boom. And I'm like, there's a hack, capital letters. And I was like, all right, I actually have to leave the dinner table and address the situation. And then I flicking on Twitter and I was like, the defiant tweets out, you know, be careful out there. And I'm like, oh, my friends is looking after this. So, OK, everyone's <laughs> up and alive looking out what's going on. So, I mean, this is a story that pulled people away on their Saturday evenings to get to their computer. Um, I don't know, Robin, can you break it down for me what exactly happened? Because to me, I look at it and I'm like, uh, I don't think nobody got hurt. It's just like, I don't have much to say about it. Don't click on dodgy links. Well, it's a little bit more complicated than that. And we have to give it some context that NFTs have been understandably targeted by scammers in lots of different ways through uh, fake DMs in Discord channels, through uh, setting up fake websites where if you approve your wallet for that website, there was ways in which you could be targeted by suspicious tokens. People have had tokens airdropped into their wallets and OpenSea now hides those automatically, but it's, it gets, you know, sometimes if you try to sell those, you could be exploited. So people are naturally very, very worried about everything that they interact with from uh, an NFT perspective. And we had a, an exploit, which I think we'll cover in a, in a, a later story today, specifically targeting inactive listings. So people would, were worried about this. There was going to be an upgrade to the smart contracts from OpenSea. So OpenSea announced a migration. This is where it all goes wrong. So there's a week-long migration period where anyone who had a, a listing on OpenSea at, the, at this point would then have that listing contract migrated to a new one that didn't have this loophole baked into it. So they sent out an email. And then, of course, in the time that they sent out that email, scammers sent out a fake email that would then allow them to capture the signature of the person's OpenSea account, which would mean that they were then able to sell any NFT that they had in that account. That was weird. But what was even weirder was not that many people clicked on this phishing link, because that's what it was. Some of them were, you know, had like quite significant collections of Azukis, and there was uh, Nate Rivers had a bored ape. But the attacker spent about four hours selling NFTs and then gave a bunch of them back. And he gave <laughs> Nate Rivers, whose ape he sold, 50 ETH bag. He's like, thanks, mate. I think he sold it for like 99 ETH or something. Here's 50% commission for me selling your ape. <laughs> it's just, it's just weird. So um, it ended up that like, you know, the news came out like this is a $200 million hack. It was like, oh my God, everybody's NFT collection is at risk right now. That was what everyone was worried about. But in fact, it was just people not exercising sufficient um care when clicking through a link. Nate Rivers himself, in a series of tweets, said he hadn't accessed his emails for weeks and he hadn't clicked on a suspicious link. Now, whether he's just whitewashing his own credibility here, I don't know. But it just makes you so nervous to do anything regarding OpenSea right now. I, I'm not touching it. I don't go anywhere near it. I am waiting till they have migrated uh, all the accounts and everything is like tested and has some serious testing. But like, it just reminds you how very vulnerable we are. And it's our human error. It's us, the meaty bits between our ears that is is the point of vulnerability. Cami. Yeah, I mean, I think, well, one thing to, to like to add, um, uh, as you said, the surprising thing wasn't that people clicked on it, but how few people actually clicked on, on the links. Um, so in total, it looks like 15 people were affected. 
um, by this phishing attack. And um, I, 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 for around 1.7 million uh, of in, in NFTs sold. So, you know, um, it, it's, it's still a big number uh, that this person was able to walk away with, the, with, that this hacker was able to walk away with. Um, even after returning um, some ETH and some NFTs. And by the way, we, we keep seeing this trend over and over again uh, in crypto and, and DeFi and the NFT space. Hackers just, you know, kind of always or, or, or many times give some uh, of the money back to their victims. And I don't know if this is common in uh, outside of crypto, uh, but it, it's become kind of like... Um, I don't know, like like a play sheet, you know, like okay, after you 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 walk away with with the funds, you return some of it. Um, so I don't know what to like. So the the easy conclusion to this is obviously be careful with the links that you click. Um, there are many uh, hackers uh, and scammers out there looking to, you know. Uh, get get uh, make money uh, through through NFTs, um, but at the same time, you know, like these people are they 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 are NFT holders. Like they, they they're not people who um, are necessarily kind of newbies to crypto. Uh, they they they're NFT traders like this like board ape holder. Um, so it's. It's just like yes, like obviously be careful. But uh, the, what what makes this scary is that these weren't necessarily newbies who were falling for for these links. So yeah, I, I think kind of Robin is right to to be extra cautious and not touch anything until the entire system has migrated and is you know more protected against uh, against these loop loopholes um, and scams. Um, and then I think maybe this kind of will segue to some of the other uh, news that we wanted to, to talk about. Even if this is the case that uh, there are so many scammers out there, um, in the end, th these hacks do leave a trail on chain that's uh, you know there forever and it's public. So the the, I guess like the silver lining of all of this is that it's becoming um, easier and and uh, and east or, or like it's it's common it's it's becoming more known how to track down these scammers and, and these hackers. Uh, but I don't know like if, if that's uh, how big of a consolation that is for for people who who are now like lost out on on their board apes and NFTs. Well, it's interesting that the, the return funds is, I guess it's an insurance policy. So there are white hat bounties and they, they're starting to pay better than they used to, but they're still not amazing. I, I've seen certain projects have been raising the bounties to, to try and um, maneuver hackers in the right direction. But I think in this case, and often by returning some of the funds, they reduce the risk that people will come after them. So it's really not worth the victim's while to pursue because they got some of it back. So they, they, it kind of softens the blow. So in a sense, it's a kind of backdoor white hat bounty or, or you know, some form of taxation uh, on the victims. And you should probably view it as such. I don't think it's, I don't think it's, it's well-meaning in any way at all. It's just a way of protecting yourself from likely prosecution or, as you rightly say, the risk that the, there are sophisticated tools that will track you down. And that gives us the perfect segue into our next story, courtesy of Laura Shin. Elaine, did you follow this one, the drama about the, the DAO hack and the possible identity of the person that perpetrated this? No, so you sent me this link and I started reading into it and I was like, yo, this is like an exclusive piece from Laura Shin. I am a huge fangirl of Laura Shin. She's one of the first you know, crypto podcasters that I listened to on the street when I was in the streets of South Korea. But, you know, it is a piece that I think it's better uh, read. So uh, would you respect the piece? Um, go and read it. it. It's out on Forbes right now. But going back to the point, what Cami said, 
is it it shows you that cryptocurrency is traceable. That's what I take uh, from the story away. And it's probably the most transparent financial system you know, that we currently have. Um, but what's worth noticing for me, it, it was the years going back. And now we've had time to look and investigate over this kind of uh, hacks that happened. So also in 2016, you can't forget the story where recently the U.S. Department of Justice um, seized and arrested, you know, that couple who was responsible for that 3.6 um, billion worth of, I think it was Bitcoin that they stole. But again, it just sort of touches on both of these stories, how traceable and trackable cryptocurrency hacks are. Yeah, absolutely. So this, Laura Shen has supposedly, allegedly, we must say, tracked down the perpetrator of the DAO hack. The DAO hack is probably one of the most significant pieces of Ethereum history that we have. And it is contentious. And Kami is a historical biographer of the Ethereum network. You probably have a better insight into this than anyone else. Can you explain what that DAO hack was like as briefly as possible? Because it can go on a long time. I know that. Yeah. Okay, so this is 2016. Ethereum had been live for only a year. There weren't many applications or, or things happening on Ethereum at the time. The one thing that was happening um, in 2016 was the DAO. And the DAO is, was a, basically a decentralized venture fund. So um, people put money into a smart contract and then they got DAO tokens in return. And with those tokens, they were they would be able to vote on what projects get funded. Um, it was a project that was started by this company called Slockit, one of the first kind of Ethereum-based projects. And um, it attracted everyone's attention at the time. Uh, like Vitalik was an advisor, Kevin Wood, like all kind of Ethereum OGs and royalty were involved. And so when the fundraising happened, it, it started just like, like money just started pouring in uh, to the DAO smart contract. And it ended up raising um, what was worth 15% uh, of all ETH issued on, on the Ethereum network at the time. So it really kind of the entire Ethereum ecosystem and like a big chunk of, of uh, Ethereum, Ethereum's funds were in the DAO. And then um, shortly after the fundraising, like, uh, yeah, the fundraising started, um, the DAO smart contracts uh, was um, being drained. So a hacker found a loophole, a way to, um, a vulnerability in the code of the smart contract to start draining the ETH inside, inside of it. Um, and so, you know, uh, developers, uh, in, in the Ethereum community huddled together, then they, they, they attacked the hacker, but in the end, um, you know, as, as they were like hacking back the, the funds, uh, there was this whole uh, debate within Ethereum whether, <clears throat> whether they should uh, just, you know, start uh, from a blank slate and do a hard fork, which would um, uh, kind of reverse history to a time before the hack happened. The, the Ethereum community ended up deciding to do this hard fork. Um, it was very controversial, of course. And so they did the hard fork and then thinking that the, the old Ethereum chain would die, uh, but then miners got together and, 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 uh, and started giving the old Ethereum chain life, uh, which became Ethereum Classic. Um, and then the new Ethereum chain um, started without kind of the without the DAO uh, there. So in the end, um, the the hacker, uh, all their, the the funds that they, that uh, they had stolen were stuck on Ethereum Classic. Um, so even even with um, ETC being worth a lot less than than Ethereum it was still worth a lot. Like it was still worth about a hundred million. Um, but, it, you know, because of how traceable uh, crypto is, um, he, he hadn't been able to move uh, much of it. Uh, and, and so that's kind of 
what Laura uh, discovered, that actually um, those funds had started to move. And with the help of Chainalysis and with other kind of blockchain tracking tools, um, they were able to uh, apparently uh, track down who the hacker was. Um, uh, this was also with the help of uh, Alex Van de Sand, who was involved in the, this group that went to attack the, the attacker, and he was being investigated by Brazilian police because he's Brazilian. And so he went to Lara being like, they're investigating me that, you know, I had, I, I, I was like trying to prevent the hack from happening. And so he helped her as well. Um, and in the end, kind of all this kind of blockchain trail led back to uh, the CEO of 10X, um, who, I mean, 10X was one of the first ICOs ever to have happened on Ethereum. Um, the, the guy's name is Toby Hunish. I don't know, I'm probably not pronouncing that uh, <laughs> properly. Um, but yeah, so he refused to, to speak with Laura. He, like, he denied that he is actually the hacker. Um, and from uh, what Laura could gather, uh, he had been warning about vulnerabilities to the DAO. And I guess he felt like he wasn't being taken seriously. So if he actually is the hacker, um, what may have happened is that he decided to prove his point by hacking the contract himself. So. <laughs> Well, whoever the hacker was, I doubt that they ever thought that it would result in the contentious hard fork. Yeah. And th I think the, the point of that hard fork is that it demonstrates that if the will is strong enough, the immutability of a chain is up for debate. And Ethereum will never be able to walk that back. Mm -hmm. So they rolled the chain back to before the hack had happened. So it's as if that transaction never did happen, made everyone whole again. But that is a deeply troubling thing for anyone looking into the history of Ethereum to say, well, now we have a precedent. Now this can happen again. That's the, the difficult thing here. One of the interesting things I, I picked out on this, I mean, it's a really fantastic read in terms of forensic journalism, but it's also, as Elaine was saying, the tools that forensic firms have now at their disposal is pretty extraordinary. And Laura makes a point out of the way that they were able to unmix a mixed transaction. So when you send Bitcoin through a mixer, it mixes up transactions and what gets spat out the other side should be, in theory, untraceable. Often hackers will steal ETH, send it through Tornado Cash, and then it comes out the other side washed. It's effectively a way of laundering your ETH. This was done through Wasabi, but what Chain Analysis has been able to do is unmix the coins that have gone into Wasabi. And if you can do that, then the washing is effectively nullified. That's pretty spectacular. So you now have these, you basically have nowhere to hide because for hackers, there's always some point of contact with the internet. They have to connect to the internet in some form or other. And most hackers trip up there. They, they leave an IP address or they leave, you know, a, an email address that's easy to trace. It's actually very, very difficult to cover your tracks at that end. It's quite easy to cover your tracks on chain if you know what you're doing. Um, but now by demystifying these tumblers, they've elucidated another one of the dark corners that um, hackers have been hiding in. And of course, the easy thing to say is, well, this is just full of hackers. Blockchain is full of hackers and scammers. It's like, well, yeah, it may, may well be, but they won't be there for long if it's that easy to uncover them. So yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing to listen to the both of you talk about this, because I think cryptocurrency security is going to be the next biggest thing in the years to come. I mean, the only thing I mix with my wasabi is soy sauce. So I have absolutely a whirlwind and a vortex hole to keep learning about that. But Cami, I was just Googling, you wrote a whole book actually based on this called like how an army of crypto hackers is building the next internet with Ethereum. Um, that's amazing. So I think like, oh, just cryptocurrency security is just something that you've got to be so careful. And week after week of doing the show, I just, Every time I take away a security nugget, and and yeah, it's good. <laughs> well, it, it, that's the thing. If the demand is there <clears throat> from large enough institutions, they'll figure out a way to make it more secure. And so the hacks need to happen 
in order for us to understand the vulnerabilities. And mm. you can't stay ahead of the hackers. They're always going to be smarter than you. They're always going to spot vulnerabilities faster than you can. But that's why companies like Immunify that we've spoken to, <clears throat> they advocate for extremely generous bounties for white hat hackers. Like make the bounties so generous that it's worth more to take the bounty than it is to um, participate in a hack. That's it. That's that's really the only way to combat this. Yeah, I think you know the, the takeaway from this. Um, I mean, is definitely it's not a matter of if a hack on a pu public blockchain will be found out. Is it's when you know, like this is the biggest hack on Ethereum. It it had been a mystery since 2016, and now there is a pretty kind of credible um, theory as to uh, who did it. I mean, we can't state like for a fact that that this person is the actual hacker, but you know, there there are many clues um, that lead to his, like to the 10X IP address and, and so on. Um, so I think that that's a good thing for the blockchain industry as, you know, a, a credible layer for the financial industry. If, if um, if the, the the big kind of criticism to blockchain and crypto is that it's a it's a den for hackers and thieves and for illicit activity to happen, you know, this is another argument that proves that wrong. That you know, actually, it's that's a horrible place for illicit activity because everything is on chain and public, and and you will be uh, traced and tracked down if you do something that's um, illegal. But the I think the negative point about this for crypto is the lack of privacy, because while you know it, it's it's great that uh, the criminals can be found out, it's not so great that you, as just like a normal uh, citizen doing you know just using the blockchain for legitimate uh, use cases, uh, that you cannot keep your privacy. Um, so I think that's something that will need to be uh, figured out. And, you know, there's so many people, br brilliant minds uh, working on uh, different cryptography, you know, cryptography solutions for this, um, zero knowledge proofs and, you know, other mixers and uh, privacy uh, focused blockchains, um, like secret network and, you know, uh, well, uh, Monero is like the classic one. Uh, Ccash, you know, there, there's just like so much work being done, um, but yeah, I, I don't think that that's been fully cracked yet. Like how how to have a public blockchain that's that can also preserve users' privacy, um, and I think that's kind of the flip side of this. So well, the, guy, the, the the guy on OpenSea who hacked and took away a few NFTs. One of the one person who got hacked just tweet well tweeted on Saturday. So the hacker sent back my pudgy penguins. The disrespect. <laughs> I enjoyed that. Yes. Well, th this issue of privacy, it's it's going to be a big deal when we talk about CBDCs and how much information governments have over our financial transactions. There, there are companies, and I remember we, we used to talk about Fendora when we were, I was at Harmony, which would allow you to do auditable privacy, programmable privacy, which means you can do things like reveal that you have a certain amount of funds if you are if you know if you're an investment fund you could say uh, we, we have the funds we can reveal that much but we're not going to tell you what those funds are allocated towards so you can set um, levels of privacy within all of that and i think that's probably going to be the next big frontier i'm allowing you to have a certain amount of information but up to a point uh it's tough this it's tough this it really is because the, the privacy thing is like a constant struggle of balance. Yeah, do we want everybody to know everything about everything? No, of course not. Uh, yeah, it's it's a tricky one. So Russia's been in the news. I have no idea why. Anything that <laughs> popped up? I mean, it wasn't much of a surprise, was it? It's been kind of foreshadowed for weeks, and it had a understandable and predictable knock-on effect on the markets, which then knocked um, Bitcoin as well. So risk on assets, and then gold went up as a result. No big surprises there, but I guess curious to see what's going to happen next and if there's any surprising stories that jump out from all of this maybe el salvador any thoughts um look i think there's still a lot of tension over in east ukraine um over the past week with the news and everything but it 
it certainly is a rough start to to the cryptocurrency market and there's no signs of cooling off because i think ukraine's about to announce like a 30-day state of emergency but uh, i think what you're recognizing or that i'm seeing for sure is basically that bitcoin is starting to be old enough to to recognize as more of a, a macro asset class so investors will you know prioritize commodities such as gold and crude oil rather than you know more volatile assets like cryptocurrency um, i mean i think it's been dipping at one of its lowest looking at bitcoin price 38 36 is touching which is a pretty low point over the past year um but also going on in that patch of the world is that also this week um, amidst tensions that Russia's Ministry of Finance presented a bill earlier on this week and that it's moving forward to regulate cryptocurrencies in the country. I think I read something at Coindesk that basically the quote that stuck out to me was the policy split with the Bank of Russia, which opposes regulation and would rather see cryptocurrency trading and mining banned. So much is happening in that region. Um, you know, I, not to self-promote, but I do have a video coming out on Friday. I was in uh, Miami a couple of weeks ago where I was at a global uh, alternatives investment conference talking to hedge fund managers, wealth allocators, and we touched on basically how geopolitics affects cryptocurrencies with asset um, managers. And, and so I think that's a good one to look out for. So just looking at how, you know, cryptocurrency market behaves when China and Russia sort of pulls the trigger to, to sort of talk about banning cryptocurrencies. So I think that's just a really interesting area to, to look out for. Yes, nothing is ever as it seems when it comes to governments and their relationship with crypto. Uh, it tends to be when the price is dumping, then the negative sentiment comes in and they get a bit scared. So uh, let's see what happens with that. Um, the, just one final story I wanted to, to jump into is, again, it's about scammers and it's about this coin safe moon that went on a massive run last year for, for reasons that nobody could really understand. And a bunch of influencers have now found themselves the target of pump and dump lawsuits. So we've got Jay Paul, Soldier Boy, and a few others. Oh, Soldier Boy. Soldier Boy. Soldier Boy and uh, the world's favorite boxer, Jake Paul. So, Cammy, doesn't this feel eerily reminiscent of 2017 all over oh, again? Totally. totally, yeah. I mean, this safe moon story, it feels like every other kind of, you know, token, uh, meme coin story. It's 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 the the way that a lot of these projects operate. You know, they, they bring in ce celebrities to pump up this useless token that, I mean, literally there's like nothing to it. Like there's no project behind it. There's no utility. There's no platform or protocol or app. It's just a meme. Um, and we saw these really kind of start to gain steam last year uh, with TikTok uh, influencers promoting them. Um, and State One was one of the kind of the larger ones. Um, so yeah, it's like, it's it's nothing new. And honestly, I'm I'm glad that these things are, 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 are getting um, that, you know, that regulators are cracking down on these projects. Like, these are the type of projects that um, give crypto a bad name, and that uh, it's it's right that they are they are uh, they are called out, and and that uh, that people are um, are able to you know get get some uh, some some justice uh, after all of these promoters kind of dumped their their tokens on them. Um, I think it, it's we'll probably see more of more of these because Safe Moon was just one of of so many of these meme coins that happened last year. Um, but it's it's crazy that I don't know. The, it, it seems like this industry just you know doesn't learn. It's the same thing as 2017. Um, just uh, celebrity uh, celebrities jumping on these meme coins. Um, the social media influencers jumping on, uh, retail, like individual investors buying useless tokens and then getting dumped on. I don't know. It, it just like, it never stops. Uh, I, I wish there was like, um, uh, yeah, I hate seeing that stuff. I just think it's yeah. really dangerous when you sort of, you know, backed by popular culture of a person who's got 
so many followers. They have the verification on various uh, social media platforms. And it's a scary thing to watch because you can, it, it's almost like you can see a car crash about to happen. Um, but, you know, when someone has that many followers, it they have power and numbers. And that's what's scary for me. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, I would just say like this, like listen really, to really Boy should, about your investments. <laughs> it, it should really kind of highlight again that you, you really shouldn't trust. Um, I mean, it's just it, how careful people should be when 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 investing in crypto. And, and that's like seems so obvious and su such a cliche. But like a check mark, check mark on Twitter really means nothing like this. These accounts are uh, are sold for, I don't know, a couple of thousand. Um, and and you can buy a checkmark Twitter account that already has a, a bunch of followers. You can buy followers on on Twitter and Instagram. So you know if you see <clears throat> if you see like hundred thousand followers on Twitter and a checkmark account and this person kind of uh, this like unknown person with without a history and like all it says on their bio is like NFT influencer then watch out like uh, there, there have been like so many examples of these people just like basically doing pump and dump schemes um and i mean it's sad that like more people aren't aren't aware that this is happening but in the end i think kind of greed takes over unfortunately i think there's a degree to which not in every case some influencers don't realize the nature of what it is that they're doing, there's a certain naivety to it, which doesn't excuse them by any stretch, but you have to kind of get in their heads, this is how they earn a living. And if they can suddenly like double, triple, quadruple what they would normally earn through this weird cryptocurrency thing, these communities generally feel very alive and very exciting in a way that is completely reminiscent of cults. And we have to remember how cults work on the susceptible. They wrap you up in a belief system and that belief system becomes this barrier to sensible thinking, critical thinking. So that's all you see. And then so Jake Paul comes along and says, okay, yeah, this is the thing. You don't follow it because Jake Paul said it. You follow it because if Jake Paul said it, it must be something because why would they risk their reputation in this way? It's a really weird feedback loop. And I think it's, it's easy to pour scorn on it, but we also have to remember that most people coming in are vulnerable in lots of different ways, um, particularly because of the pandemic and particularly because they're young and they don't mm. know any better. So it, Damn. There, is a, there is a degree to which this is a lesson that you learn hopefully only once, but it's a lesson that if you do learn it, you don't repeat it. And so... Robin, they, they, give me some they, good they, news, man. They say, in, they say in crypto, you know, you've know, you got to pay tuition and, and it's the same for trading. You've got to get burned a few times to understand what it is that you're doing. Um, yeah. This is not to kind of advocate for everyone getting scammed, but like I think if we overprotect people from anything bad that might happen, there's no way they're going to learn anything. So that's why I'm always kind of like, well, yes, we should protect everything and like, ah, but actually we need to learn these lessons for ourselves. You know, it's, as a parent, that's kind of what you want. You want your kids to mess up and fall over and then they learn. So I don't know. It, it's, I mean, yeah, I, I hate influencers genuinely. Um, <laughs> I'm very, very kind of concerned about my own kind of reputation or presence on Twitter and everywhere else as an influencer. I'm very, very careful to use my language in the right way so I don't get accused of pump and dump. But like, yeah. Good, good, good. So I'm like yeah. a delinquent child now. I want some good news. Can we please talk about some good news? Any good news in the space this week? Uh, El well. Salvador, El Salvador, it said, wait, isn't El Salvador some good news? Well, we, yes, El Salvador should always be treated with slightly a delicate touch. <laughs> Massage it into me. What's going well, on? Well, because as much as, as much to... as, yes, as much yeah, as, the, as much as Bitcoin and, and, and the story there is positive. There's a lot about Bukele and, and that entire country that is yeah, it's problematic. So. I never want to give it too much oxygen. I would like to go there and see it for myself. Uh, I haven't had a chance to do that yet, but maybe um, towards the end of the year we might be able to do that. Because I think it's so, an, I think it's an interesting story, but like, yeah. So, so the story they, is before because we haven't touched on it at all. The story is that the the tourism minister said 
um, that basically 30%, I think, more people is visiting El Salvador because of its adoption of Bitcoin as a legal tender. Yes, and El Salvador's GDP grew 10.3% in 2021. Um, good for them. Good for them. I'm still skeptical about El Salvador. You don't want to do this story, Robin. You're like, <laughs> I don't. I'm really scared of I it. I don't. I don't. <laughs> Too many things about that 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 regime and that country that that give you pause for thought, and I think that's okay right. to be skeptical. It's okay to be skeptical. Cami, um, any thoughts on that one? On a other, um, yeah. Well, I'm 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 kind of on board with you, Robin. Like uh, Nayib Bukele is like such an authoritarian figure, um, and he was just like shoving Bitcoin down everyone's throats there. Um, I like I I, I asked. Uh, a question on these lines to to Vitalik on our podcast. I, I think it was last week, um, and I I really kind of liked his take, which was genuine bit like Bitcoin and and crypto adoption more generally uh, should come from the ground up, not from the top down. Like it should be like right. grassroots and communities and you know people themselves who want to use this. Uh, uh, want to use crypto um, as, as a store of value or means of exchange or whatever. Um, but when it's kind of a government forcing it on, on its people, and, and it really was forced, uh, you know, like when, when Bitcoin was, uh, was made legal tender, there were uh, protests in the country because, mm -hmm. you know, there was um, a, a, big, a large group of people who just like didn't want it. Um, unlike other countries in, in Latin America, El, El Salvador was dollarized, so it didn't have the issues of uh, a devaluing currency, of like double-digit inflation. Although we all know uh, the U.S. now does have like higher inflation, but nothing compared to like the levels of inflation that you see in other places in the region. Um, so you know, it wasn't like such a huge need to have a, a like. Bitcoin be be the legal tender. Uh, I understand kind of a country's um, need to be, be independent from the U.S. Like for sure. Like why would El Salvador have the same kind of monetary regime as the U.S.? They're completely different economies. Uh, so in that in that sense, like Bitcoin was useful. But on the other sense, like like I said, it wasn't like a, a huge kind of problem that uh, that the people of El Salvador were asking for. To have Bitcoin be their currency, so anyways, like that—that's kind of my take on it. Um, but you know, I think it's great that it, it spurred interest in the country. People are visiting. Uh, like, uh, like you know, Robin wants to go because he wants to check it out. Like, like, yeah. like Robin, I want, I want to check it out myself. And, and thousands of people uh, are going there because they want to see, oh, like this Bitcoin country, uh, mm -hmm. how sustainable that is. I don't know. I think it's kind of a novelty that will likely wear out uh, with time. So yeah, we'll see. I think it, it's an amazing experiment, um, and it will be, you know, super uh, informative to see how this plays out in the long term for other countries who are thinking about similar uh, avenues. Yeah, it's really interesting to me because the the instinct that we have in in Web three is that. We should all adopt blockchains and cryptocurrencies. But I've been following the story of why gamers hate NFTs because they really, 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 really hate NFTs, and they've been extremely vocal in their dislike of NFTs to the extent they pressured big game companies to withdraw NFT products they might have had for games. And I really wanted to understand why, and it's because they feel like these massive publishers are forcing NFTs down their neck, and they're forcing economics and marketplaces into a space where they don't belong. And I thought it was really interesting because, the, the, you know, instinctively you think NFTs, games, blockchain, it should all work, but gamers don't want it. And you kind of have to respect that. They made their voices heard. They stood up and said, we don't want this. And they actually achieved what they wanted. They, the game companies listened to them and said, oh my God, we should take you seriously, actually. Uh, where that's going to end up, I don't know. But it just goes to show that, you know, not everything can be sold by blockchain. And those who reject it, sometimes I have a really good reason for it. And it's been a, a real, really interesting story for me just to, to go in there and actually really dig into what it is they're saying and why they're saying it. I, and it was, 
genuinely fascinating. So this it sort of mirrors this idea of just from the top down forcing things onto people. Um, having said that, gamers would be very happy to implement blockchain and NFTs if they made the gaming experience better. And it wasn't forcing them into basically working and grinding and paying for things that they haven't had to pay for before. So I, really want that story on a, I want that story on video in your metaverse, Robin. I want to see that. Uh, it's happening. We're hey. the guys are right over there now, building building the shots. It's going out Friday. <laughs> uh, I will be a meta human. I'm actually a game, a playable game character now. I it's love wild. that so it's much, wild. so much. Awesome. So, if you weren't already aware, we have not been playing around on this episode of Real Vision Birth of Defiant, but we will be around next week. Uh, Elaine, do we know who's going to be joining us on the panel next week? I believe it's Ash Bennington, but I'm not sure. TBA, who knows? It might be Ralph Powell. Ash should be. Unconfirmed. Well, listen, uh, thanks very much for joining us this week, Cammy. Always a pleasure. And we will see you on the very next week's episode of Real Vision Birth of the Defiant.